So while we're waiting for more people to join, my name is Shelby Prasad and I actually started this page a couple of years ago to spread more awareness about what podiatric medicine is. And I also work on the page with two other, two other contributors, Samana and Jonathan. So we hope that you like what we've been working on. And for those of you who are currently in school, we have a series going on right now called the Exploring Externship Series. So we're very excited to have on um, our guest today to get more tips about how to tackle interviews. So a couple of other updates and things that are happening for those of you who missed it. Um, we do have merchandise and I'll be giving out a code at the end of our interview. So you can use that to get 15% off. So definitely stick around until the end. And then upcoming or coming up later this week on Wednesday, we have a talk with APMA about how to excel during your first two years as a podiatric medical student. So I hope you all can join us then as well. So last but not least, I'm going to welcome on Dr. Josephine Lyons. She just finished her residency at um, a program formerly, formerly known as uh, Columbia St. Mary's, but it's now known as Ascension Wisconsin. So uh, let's see, let's have her on and get all of our questions answered. I know I have a ton. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. Thank you for joining us this Sunday evening. Hooray. I'm coming to you from a sunny Southern California backyard. Um, you may see my dog pass in and out, but other than that, we should be uninterrupted. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. We're all about dogs and pets here. <laughs> All right. Excellent. So I'm here to talk to everybody about crushing your DPM interview. And interviewing definitely is a skill. I would say that you want to have a presence without being overbearing. You want to be charismatic and charming without too much cheese. You want to be have, have a lot of self-awareness and be able to translate that and use your interpersonal skills in a great way. So in an interview, you should be showing the best parts of yourself. And if there are any missteps that you need to identify, then you can use those later. Uh, you should come to terms with yourself in very honest ways and be able to present any missteps in a very palatable way. Okay. I've always found that I do well in these types of meetings because I have a theater background. I have a stage background. I've been on stage. I've been backstage. I've taught children's theater. And if you see me using my hands a lot, that's why. And I, I generally have an outgoing personality and you might hear me doing some funny voices. So, and, and that kind of thing, but just be prepared. So <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. awesome. So we'll get right in. I, hope that I can translate some of my experiences both as an onstage presence and from my time as an interviewee and also an interviewer. I was on the other side when I was with my program. I got to interview students coming in wanting to be a part of my residency. So I'll give you a little insight on that too. Oh, definitely. And then for those of you who are joining us right now, if you have any questions, you can put it in the question box below or you can put it in the comments. And so I'll be bringing that to Dr. Lyon's attention as we're going along. But yeah, go perfect. Ahead. Okay, so I'm going to do this in a timeline format to help us get prepared. Okay. So about two months before you have your interviews, you'll need to choose your programs. And I believe your selection might come up a little bit ahead of two months, but we'll just say two months to kind of group it all together. Okay. So choosing your programs. I think that you should apply for an interview with all of the programs that you did an externship with. Whether they grant you one, that's a different story, but you should at least apply to all of those programs. Then I think that it's much like applying to college. You want to have a few reach programs and a few safe programs. So some where you know them really well, you think you have a good chance getting in there, and some where you're like, oh, I always wanted to go here. Maybe I'll try in the interview, you know, like maybe I'm not smart enough to actually go here, but let me try, you know. So I always advocate have a few reach. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. 
I would get advice from upper years who went to these programs, or if you went to these programs yourself, that's always a good thing. You can ask a, a residency director if you have one in one of your schools or no one personally, you could say, hey, what's going on at this program that I don't know anything about because they all know each other. So <laughs> okay. that's, a, that's something to know. You always hear podiatry is really small and it is. Uh, surprisingly so, the more you rank, rank up, you, you realize just how small it is. Oh my so God. Okay. yes, so if you did, um, while you're doing your research on all of these programs, you should go back into your little black book and of all of the information that you have compiled about this program. What were the director's names, if there's more than one? What are the residents' names? Who graduated? Who's coming in? Are there, if you externed there, are there any procedures that you really liked? Did you see anything cool while you're there? What really draws you to this program? Why do you need this information in the forefront of your brain? Because they will ask you in interviews, why this program? Okay. Or, oh, tell me a resident that made an impact while you were here. And you have to be able to name somebody. And you don't want to go, oh, crap, was it John or James? I'm not sure. So you want to be able to actually give some real frame of reference to your answers. Okay. The other thing to know is you should contact a resident that is currently at the program or a recent graduate could be okay. The reason to contact a resident is you want to see, do they require a follow-up visit? Do they need you to come back? Some programs require you to come back and like prove your interest. My oh, program didn't do that, but you... some do. So. Okay. And this is yes. extra and they want you to come back and just kind of check in, check out the place for a day or two. Yes. Um... So, yes. So sometimes I, I advocated in my program that we should not do this because people are from all over the country and where my program was in Wisconsin it's at least two planes. There's not really any direct flights to get into Milwaukee. You've got to go through a couple different airports to okay. get there. So, and not everybody, you know, we have Shoal that's very close in Chicago. So it would be an unfair advantage to have those kids coming back all the time and have kids from California or, you know, East Coast saying, I can't get there. There's no way I can get there. Yeah. And I, I said it's unfair, but there are still programs out there that say you must come back in order to prove you are interested in us. Wow, that's good to know. I didn't realize yes. <laughs> yes. Um, not everybody does. But regardless of whether they want you to do that or not, you should definitely, definitely get in touch with a resident, no matter what, and voice your interest. A simple text message is fine. Hi, how you doing? I've had a great year of externing, and I just wanted to let you know your program is high on my radar. I think you guys are great, and I'm really looking forward to interviewing with you. Any updates you can give me would be appreciated. That's always a great way to go. And you'll also want to ask them, hey, have there been any updates? Maybe they got a new attending. Maybe you want to meet the new first years. Maybe you want to pop by if you are in the area and just to meet them socially. It doesn't all have to be academic. So that's something to think about, too. Okay. If you didn't extern at this program, you have to find a way to get in contact with a resident. <laughs> okay. So you'll want to look on their website, go through their list, and then contact whoever their HR person is, not the director, the, whoever the office person is. The office person can usually get you in contact with a resident. Just say, hey, I'm a student. I have some questions. Can you get me in contact? They usually give you an email. You email this person, try to set up a phone call. Most people are very, very willing to give you 10, 20 minutes. And almost every residency program has a resident who is designated as the student contact or the go-between. So they'll give you a specific person who does this as part of their job. Okay. And what, what do you ask them on this, on this phone call? Uh -huh. interview? I have a lot of good questions to ask, and I will tell you all of those when we get there. Okay. Those are very similar to questions that you may or may not want to ask in an interview if you have any questions. So we'll get there. Okay. I promise. Okay. Um, okay. So then um, the other thing to do two months ahead of time is you need to clean up your act. And what I mean by that is check your social medias. 
if there is anything on there, and I mean peruse, I mean back to those pictures you took when you first opened your account, however old you were. And if there's anything, anything at all on there that you are not proud of today, not, oh, I look silly or I'm making a silly face, but things that might be considered questionable content, mm -hmm. I would recommend that you delete that now. Um, and it's a good rule of thumb that you should always think before you post and never, ever, ever post anything that could be considered illegal, i.e. underage drinking, any drug use of any kind, things that we know are not okay. There are also in this digital age and this world that we're absorbed in social media, there's a lot of more special issues that come up. Things like politics, highly opinionated things that come up and people will post on different forums their highly volatile or highly controversial opinions on different factors. There's even of age drinking that people may or may not consider appropriate. You know, if you just have you with a wine glass and your friends and you're of age, that's okay. If you're all just cheersing or you have a, a you know, one drink in your hand, that's fine. But you don't need a picture of you passed out on the floor. You yeah. see the difference. <laughs> yes. yes. So uh, there's also been things coming up about, you know, is swimwear appropriate to have on a professional account? And that is for each person to decide on their own. I would say that you must define for yourself what professionalism that word means to you. Mm -hmm. And if you feel comfortable, then you may do what is appropriate for your comfort level. And the other thing I would say is that if a program has vastly different standards than you do, say you're okay posting a picture of yourself in a bathing suit, man or woman, mm -hmm and the program maybe not, then is that program truly for you? Just something to consider, food for thought. As we move on, now we're one month before, plan out your attire. And I know that everybody has lots and lots of questions of this. So I've divided it up into men and women. Women, we're gonna tackle you first and we can always circle back because I know we have tons of questions. Okay. So here we go, women. And why you're planning this a month before is because you need to either plan it or purchase it. Ah. So <laughs> okay. the, for women, I would recommend, I would recommend that you get a suit, a professional full suit jacket and pants together or have a blazer and pants that match. Why I would recommend a suit is because skirts bring up a lot of extra questions. If you want to wear a skirt, you have to wear a skirt or anywhere in between, you can. There's nothing saying that you can't wear a skirt, but I, there are some questions there. So if you are going to wear a skirt, knee length is an absolute must. It must be at least knee length. And the cut is very important. It should come straight down from your hips, not tapered like a pencil, because then we're looking a little too fashionable. And this is still a male dominated field. You want to look like you are employable. You want to look hireable not photo ready. This is not the fashion plate. Okay. Yes. So no, no flare out and no cut in. So no pencils, no flares. It's got to come straight down from your hips and knee length is a must. And then you have to ask yourself, do you need to wear pantyhose or tights or stockings of any kind? If you do, I would say that you should wear something sheer, but also something that's gray or black in tone because nude can look like you're not wearing pantyhose or tights at all. Yeah. So the other thing is that once you wear a skirt, your shoes are now on display. And most women think that by wearing a flat, they have minimized the femininity of a skirt. Not so. You stand differently in heels and a skirt than you do in flats. So I would recommend a short, short, one inch or less kitten heel with a skirt. Uh -huh. You will look better. Your line will look better. It looks professional without being hoochie. Okay. I don't know if I can say That's that word, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Um, I would avoid sweaters and I would avoid going with just your business top and pants. I would say a jacket is a must. However, you do not need to button it. Okay. The men do. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Pro tip, 
which I will have a couple of pro tips while we go through this. Pro tip is there's usually sales around the holidays. So the winter holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, you know, all of those holidays that come up in their New Year's, there's usually some sales. So okay. shop for suits then. Okay, a that's time. a good tip for doing it early Great enough. Time. That... Yes, Getting absolutely. Ahead. Planning ahead is what it's all about. So um, your shirt, you can show a little style, but I would still keep it professional looking. So I am not a button up kind of person. That's not what I wear. So I did not wear a button up. However, I was told that I am a girly girl. So I should, uh, by one of my uh, mentors, she said that I should tone down my girly girlness. Obviously, I'm still going to do my hair. I'm still going to do my makeup and nails, but that I should maybe wear not florals, not girl colors, not this kind of thing. So I wore a nice blue blouse, solid, no prints. If you need a little more flash in your life, a small, small print is okay. The louder and bolder stuff, leave it at home. doesn't need to go to the okay. interview. Um, the... I would say for girls, try to avoid pastels. It doesn't make you look like a grown-up. So okay. a more saturated color is going to be better. So go for a jewel tone, a purple, a blue, a green, or any autumnal color will work just fine. So like a rich gold or a burnt orange or a dusty something uh, will look just fine. If you start going into the baby pinks, the baby blues, you look a little young women generally speaking okay for the men the men suit and tie suit and tie it's not optional and you must must wear a tie it must be tied and it you sh if you don't know how to tie a tie you should learn now somebody um, um still doing okay Okay. Okay, great. Um, so the, the suit coat. Yes, I can hear you. You're breaking up. But is yes, good. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, yes. are we all set? <laughs> okay. All right, good. So men, if you don't know how to tie a tie, you should learn now. It doesn't need to be a fancy wins or not or anything. Just a simple knot will do. And your suit jacket should be one or two buttons. Special consideration with men and jackets. While the women can be unbuttoned all the time, the men, if you have a little skill or a little practice, you'll buttoning and unbuttoning. What is this? Men, if you see professional men in a situation, sometimes they will button and unbutton their coat as they sit and stand. So when you enter a room as a man, your coat should be buttoned. It should be buttoned, one button together. You shake hands, then you release the handshake, and once you have been invited to sit down, as you are sitting, you skillfully unbutton the jacket and sit down. As you stand up at any point, whether it's a dinner, an interview, anything, you must skillfully be ready, grab the suit. As you are standing, button the coat and deliver your handshake. If you do not feel confident doing the skillful button unbutton dance, don't touch it. Don't touch it, leave it buttoned. It's not worth you struggling and getting all flustered just for the button trick. It's not worth it. So, I know. Then the uh, colors. So, you don't need to just have white, gray, and blue. You can branch out a little bit. White may be too crisp if you're wearing a black suit. It might look a little bit too much like a funeral. You might want to branch into a color spectrum. On the other hand, if you have different coloring your hair and your skin, black can be very flattering or black can be really too harsh. And you want to go with what looks good on your skin and hair and your coloring overall and what's flattering. So the color options to explore.
for a man or for a woman, you might want to do a jewel tone like we talked about or an autumnal shade. Um, men for your tie, a bow tie is okay if you are a bow tie kind of person. If you're not a bow tie kind of person, I would say avoid bow ties. Are we doing okay on connection? Okay, okay good. Um, all right. I'm doing okay. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, good. Um, oh, another for gents, hem the pants. If you're not sure about what your pants should look like, it should have one fold right in front of your shoe. There should not be multiple folds because your pants are too long or zero fold because your pants are too short. If you're not sure, ask a tailor. <laughs> they can usually do it at a dry cleaners. Just go in and ask them for it. Hemming pants is they do it all the time. It doesn't cost much at all. A couple bucks. So um, also for gents, cufflinks, too much. Tie clip, only if it's subtle. So a single bar is appropriate, but don't make anything flashy. For social gatherings, which some interviews do have, there is a special protocol. So you may have a social interview, which is, or it can be a one to do deal. And that is, an, is a chance to show a little bit more style. So for ladies, you can ditch the suit jacket and just be in your shirt. Or you can add a sweater if it's cool out. You could have a slightly more patterned top. This I would call a social business top that I'm wearing now. Um, the, yeah, suit coat can go. For the gents, it's okay to lose the tie for a social event, but you should unbutton no more than one button at the top of your collar. Only one. The rest should stay up. Um, you may, gents, ditch the suit coat in favor of a sport coat. And if you're not sure what that is, Google it. And the, if you don't have a sport coat or you don't have time to change, then just leave your suit on. But it can remain unbuttoned at a social event. And for social events, for those who are unfamiliar, usually you'd go to a professional interview and then sometimes there's a social gathering after. And okay. they usually serve some hors d'oeuvres and some light drinks, that kind of thing. And you basically just interact as a human. And they want to see if you can walk and chew gum. That's all it is. Uh, okay. So other people who are interviewing or would that just correct be like, okay. okay yes it's usually an open social where they have anybody that has interviewed who has made it past the first round is invited to a social interview if okay. the program does that and they would let you know that up front okay that's good to know. yes so then for everyone we talked about the color choices a, a potentially a, a deeper blue or a purple can work for a gentleman the uh, shoes, shoes. This is podiatry, people. Your shoes should not look like you are in pain wearing those shoes to an interview of all things. Now, this doesn't mean that ladies don't get to wear heels. Absolutely. But they should look like they're not painful. And we all know what that means. Oh, yeah. Those oh, super yeah. tall, skinny ones. <laughs> not a good look. Not at interviews. Save that for the, you know, after. Oh, yeah. The shoes for both ladies and gents should match your outfit in some way so it should complement for gentlemen if you're wearing a black suit black shoes are the only way to go don't try to get away with the brown shoes with a black suit it's not a good look gray can go either way it could be black shoes it could be gray shoes it could be brown shoes anything and it really depends on the color of the gray suit okay. Ladies, you may wish to consider either wearing a trouser sock or a stocking, if, even if you're wearing pants, just a consideration. Just try on the whole look and see how you feel. Men, you must wear full-length trouser socks. Men, you cannot, and I have seen it, get away with black ankle socks under your suit. Yes, oh, no. someone will notice, and no, you cannot get away with it. So just consider that for accessories. I know we're going way into the way into the deep, dark realm of, ex of clothing and everything for interviews, but it's important that somebody tells you accessories, consider them with caution. Watches are okay, but it shouldn't be your time to show off your new Rolex. The 
earrings that you wear should be tasteful. They don't need to be posts, but they, they can dangle. But if they do dangle, they should be tasteful. This isn't the time to show off your big multi carat you know, Swarovskis. The, if you have tattoos, they should be covered. Doesn't matter where they are. If you think you've got a little secret one, ladies back here, if you think you've got a little secret one somewhere on your wrist, or if you've got something on your hands that you think nobody will see, someone will see it. So I would say cover them for the purposes of an interview. You can bring that up another time. Rings. You should have no more than one per hand. Ladies, if you have a wedding band stacked, that counts as one ring. That's fine. The Otherwise, just try to keep it to a minimum. Ladies, for your nails, they need to be groomed. And gents, too, for that matter. The Nothing should make noise, however. So no bangles, no jingly, anything. Ladies, consider your purses. If they have a chain, you want to make sure that it doesn't make noise when you're picking it up and down, out of, going in and out of the room. You don't want anything that draws attention or makes noise. And your bag should be an understated color, something professional. You can add a fun scarf if you want or something to jazz it up, but no bold colors or anything that's as a person. Lapel pins, very important here. And I have to say it. We've got a lot of pins going through our educational career and You don't need to be fiddling with your hair or fluffing your outfit. Everything should sit properly on you and not need to be fixed while you're interviewing. So just be aware. I always keep a couple extra safety pins and bobby pins in my bag or gents in a pocket just in case something goes wrong. You don't want to lose a button day of and not have a way to sew it back on. Or at least pin your shirt closed if all else fails. That's so, so <laughs> There's a couple of questions coming up. I'm sorry. Is Absolutely. Uh, let's see. So someone had a question, um, uh, Roussel, um, a skirt or dress with a jacket? I think you kind of covered this earlier. So it depends on the type of skirt, right? And the jacket. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say that a skirt and blouse is probably a better choice than a dress, because again, it's still a male dominated profession and you want to look a little bit more male professional. So that's where the pants comes in as opposed to the skirt. I would still say a skirt and blouse is better because it's separate pieces. It breaks you up a little bit more. A dress tends to look like you're a product representative. So okay. consider that. Okay. That's good to know. And then she also had a question about Wedding rings. So I know you said wedding rings are okay. And then Absolutely. when it comes to other rings, keep it one per hand and nothing too flashy, yes. right? Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Very good questions. Right. So another pro tip, you will never be faulted for looking better. You will only be faulted for looking worse. So if you're not sure, up your game one professional level. So if you're looking at a top and saying, hmm, is this cut too much? The answer is probably. So yeah. level it up a little bit, level it up. <laughs> and also tending one month before you want to book your hotel. There's a couple of considerations when you're booking your hotel. Do you want to share a room with people or do you prefer to be alone? That's a big question. And that's everybody's personal preference, whether they're like, nope, I need my own Zen space or yeah, hey, it's way cheaper with eight people in this room. So totally up to you. Uh, okay. The <laughs> 
does the hotel have a shuttle service? A lot of them do. Interviews are at Embassy Suites at Dallas Frisco. And a lot of the neighboring hotels, it's a big hotel area. They have a lot of conventions there. So there are a lot of hotels that have shuttle services that take you to and from. But you also want to make sure distance-wise, could you walk if you had to? Say you need to get there very early or you need to come home very late, say when the shuttle's not operating. Could you walk? If all else fails, could you walk or do you need to Uber? And be prepared to plan for that. Okay. Also book your flights. Four to six weeks ahead is always the prime time to book your flights, if you didn't know that before. So that's that's a good good time. (laughs) And then... Yes. After the programs have accepted you for an interview, you need to schedule the block of time where you will interview with them. I would make sure this happens about a month before. I would make sure that you have plenty of space. And by that, I mean at least two hours between interviews. Why some interviews will run overtime? And some interviews may be able to take you in early. And you don't want to run the risk. It happens all the time that programs will run over in their interviews. And they'll start taking people later and later. And you don't want to sacrifice another interview for one interview just because you didn't make it. That being said, if you do wind up in that situation, immediately contact the people that are running the interview process and they will get things sorted out for you. Don't panic. It has happened and just fine. But you do need to contact people immediately and get things sorted out. So the other thing to know about the scheduling of interviews, the programs are divided into East and West. What they consider West is everything from about Ohio all the way west. So it's not. And with the west coast. And so does everything basically west of Ohio, Kentucky, everything in there. On the east, that's everything along the eastern seaboard. The programs get three days. And each year they flip-flop for who starts first. So the first three days, by example, they might be West Coast. Then everything kind of overlaps on Saturday evening. Following are, say, West Coast. This flip-flops every year. Just to ask somebody who is closer, but they do each year who is going to be first and I would not schedule more than about four interviews per day if you have that many to go to because you will get burned long long day to be in and you want want to make sure that you have enough stamina so then two weeks before you want to prep for your cases plan your answer topics and read a little bit of discrete knowledge We'll get more into this as we go through. Talk more about some things that you could draw on from your life experiences. And we'll get more into this in a little bit. And then discrete knowledge, read a book. Just read a book. Do something. Study something. (laughs) Uh, then okay. one week before, Do you have to- yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Was there a question? Yeah. Do you have any recommendations as far as like what, what book you think prepared you or like, were there a couple of books that you, which ones are they? Absolutely. So I really liked some of the study guides that I had access to, um, for, Your board preparations, a lot comes from the, what's it called? The uh, pod, the pod manual. It's like everybody's read it and they still pull board questions from it. I'll find it and I'll get back to you. The other (laughs) one that I like that's a study book is called Prism. And I really liked it a lot because they were one page summaries of a lot of different topics. And it would be the clinical stuff, the surgical stuff, some follow-ups, some classifications. They would have it all crammed into a one page thing. 
And I really okay. liked that, especially for going on externships. It was super small, 100 pages. I got it printed in a half size sheet form and I carried it in my white coat and I had it all the time and it was great to have. Okay, and that information is really applicable to interviews too. Yeah. Oh, it looks like put Pod Pocket and Watkins. Is that what there, you're there it is. Yep. Okay. Pocket Pod. I don't know why I couldn't awesome. think of it. It's been too long. <laughs> the, okay. So then we have, if you are one week out, so we did two weeks out now, one week out, calm yourself. That's all. <laughs> Just calm yourself. That's all. Okay. Then the day or night before, after you've arrived in Frisco, you've taken your plane, train, or automobile to get there. Night before the interview arrives, number one, calm yourself. <laughs> so... <laughs> Just whatever you need to do, just zen out. Okay. Then I would advise that you scope out the area, move into your hotel room, your Airbnb, whatever you're doing, unpack, get, you know, calm, cool, and collected, then go to Embassy Suites the day before and just walk around just so you see, okay, here's how long it took me to get an Uber or to ride the shuttle. Here's how long it took me to check in. And here's how long it takes me to find everywhere. You want to be familiar with their numbering system and how everything's going to work, where you need to be and where you where the bathrooms are is a great thing to know ahead of time. So you want to put yourself in the position of success and scoping out your war zone essentially is a great way to do that oh yeah and I'm kind of panicking you do the day of right yep there's just one less thing to worry about and embassy suites if you've never been in any embassy suites it's a giant atrium so when all the hotel rooms look onto one courtyard and it's open in the center. So when you're on all of the different floors, you can see people above and below everywhere around you. Now this gets a little weird because you will see people freaking out during interviews. You'll see people picking their nose and sitting in a way that's just really unbecoming. Um, and you want to just be aware of that. You can be seen and you may be watched from any angle. And, you interview in hotel rooms. So being that it's an embassy suites, they have a hotel, the, the room where somebody's going to be sleeping is in the back. Then there's a bathroom portion and then there's like a living room in the front. And that's where you would do your interview. Buddy to be in one room together. But the most people interview in their hotel And a pro tip from me is do not ask to use the restroom. It is, it has been done. It was done to me as an interviewer and it creates a very uncomfortable situation and it's really inappropriate. So don't ask to use anybody's restroom, like go in between when, when you have a little yeah. break. Oh yeah. That makes um, other things to know, get relaxed, get a good night's sleep. If you can't sleep, if you are the type of person who is lying awake in bed, number one, do not pick up your phone, put it down and just lie there, lie there completely still looking at the ceiling. And if you, if it, studies have shown that if you rest completely still unmoving for two hours, it's equivalent to one hour of sleep. So you will get some rest. So don't panic if, you, if you're not getting to sleep. And I, I know, oh gosh, I need to sleep. So it's, it'll be okay. Then, <laughs> then you'll, you, you can get rested that way. It'll be just fine. The day of, pack your bag if you're bringing a bag. And what I keep in my bag, I always keep a copy of my resume, my bio, my cover letter, whatever it's going to be, my CV. I always keep, you know, a little tiny mini deodorant or something to, you know, smell fresh. If you're carrying mints, then make sure that they're in a quiet package and they don't rattle. Oh, I would okay. not carry nor chew at any point, even in a social setting, gum. Do not carry it. Do not chew it. Do not be seen chewing it or even putting it anywhere near your bag. Just leave it out. Okay. It looks very unprofessional. <laughs> And Maybe the as a woman, things. 
Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Put those little, yeah. those little tab things, the Listerine tabs. Yeah. That'd be great. I never even thought of that. The, and ladies, <laughs> if you need any other uh, makeup products, or if you need to keep a comb in your bag to quick brush through some strands, hair, uh, straight hair people tend to do this a lot. They need to run a comb. Or if you have a, an extra bobby pin or an extra safety pin or some tape, just something that, it, you know, can get you through if, God forbid, panic strikes. And don't overstuff. Men, don't overstuff your pockets. Make sure you empty out that wallet. Clear out all those silly little cards that you've been carrying around for no reason. Ladies, empty out your purse. It should be very professional looking and mostly empty. You can carry a bottle of water, a small one, if you want, but otherwise I would leave things out. Always carry your ID. You never know when you're going to need it. And always carry a little bit of cash just in case you don't have your room and you, you say need something really quick at the vending machine or you have time to go to lunch. For grooming, day of, ladies, nails should be neat. Polish, if worn, should be understated and professional. No fake nails. We are surgeons. And you are not allowed to wear sur fake nails into surgery. So remember, you want to be seen as a surgeon, as a pr practicing doc. So no fake nails. Okay. Hair should be as you prefer it. It does not have to be up in a bun just because this is a professional interview. You can have it down if you like. It's however you look best and okay. pin tape, whatever you got to do, stick things where they need to be. Makeup should be to your comfort level. I would say overall less is more and less product and less color is more. So you want it to look fairly natural and less product is key. Gents, you need to clean under your fingernails. You wear deodorant, but no, and you should have groomed, but not greasy hair and it should not look wet. Do not show up to an interview with wet groomed hair like you just showered. And gents, always check your collar. ...on the cut. And be early. You should always be early. Never be on time. On time is late, and that's a theater thing. And uh, what happens if you miss your time? Again, contact the people who are in charge. And you've been sitting outside a room, sitting calmly. Avoid talking to other students. Some people are going to come out really confidently, and some people are going to come out like they just bombed everything and their life is over. Just ignore them. You've got your own thing to do, and you've got your own stuff to deal with, and you don't need to worry about anybody else, whatever's going on in their head. So the question. Absolutely. Early. What's a good what's a good time period? Like fifteen minutes earlier, twenty minutes earlier? Because I know some people show up like an hour before and that's like too too early. early. Yeah. Yeah. So it it never hurts to get there, find the room. Say you're one of those people that needs to be there an hour early. You can show up, find the room an hour early and then leave. Then go okay. away. Go hide yourself somewhere else in the hotel. They've got lounge areas and all kinds of things where you can go away. I would okay. show up about 15 minutes. 15 minutes is plenty of time. for you. And don't panic if you don't get there 15. 10 is fine too. Five might be cutting it. You know, what okay. if they're running ahead and they can take you early? Or somebody didn't come to their interview and now they can take you early. So you always want to be about 15 minutes. I know it's going to feel like eons of time when you're sitting there, absolute eons, but just find something to do, you know, something quiet. <laughs> um, before you go into an interview room, you always want to make sure that your phone is off, including, and people forget this, alarms. So you may have an alarm set from last week to pick up your dry cleaning at 4.30 and you forgot to turn it off and here it is Wednesday again and your alarm goes off in the middle of your interview. It's not a good look. Okay. The, if you need to go to the bathroom, if you're panicking, like, oh my gosh, it's 10 minutes before and I think I need to go to the bathroom. Pro tip, in theater, we call this good luck. <laughs> so 
if you have to go to the bathroom or you think you have to go right before you go on stage, we call it good luck. So you probably don't have to go. It's just your body saying like, oh my gosh, I'm panicking. I need to, I need to focus on something else. Maybe I should go to the bathroom. You don't have to go. You'll be fine. Just relax. And you don't have time at that point. If, it, if you're five, 10 minutes out, you don't have time to go to the bathroom. Sorry. You're not going to, you're going to miss it. Something's going to happen. You're going to like spray water all over your outfit. It's going to be wrong. It's going to be like a, a romantic comedy on a bad date. It's going to be bad. Just oh, yeah. karma. It's Murphy's law. <laughs> and when you enter the room, it could be one person. It could be many people. They could have a lot of people stuffed into this room. You could have only one person. And there's going to be people that you know and people that you don't. You should offer a handshake to every single person. One to two pumps only. And no, no two handers, like where you grab and then you grab on top of their hand. Don't do that. And gents don't do any of that. Like bro handshake where you like do a little extra. Don't do that. Um, ladies don't give a little fish hand. Like you're not the queen of England. Don't hand your hand like this to, <laughs> to do a shake. They're not going to kiss it. It's like a, like a dude, just handshake it. <laughs> Be professional, be strong, be present. Know, let them know that you're there. And if you're nervous or if you have uh, cotton what? mouth. Uh -huh. Oh, go ahead. And then I'll ask a question. Ah, uh, Oh, I, I see a question. Think that's a different situation. And, and I have a couple of rules for, for what this might look like for you guys this year coming up. We'll get to that in a sec. The, we're, we'll go as though it's a normal year. For now, the uh, like as we were talking about, okay, it could be it could be a, a, a if your hands sweat, you that's a, another special concern. So you you have a little time. I know it's like the worst superpower in the world. Like you just have to think about it, and they start sweating. Don't worry, I have it too. It's a problem. I have found that keeping like a little washcloth in my bag is like a great way to just kind of dry off right before I handshake. If you get cotton mouth, a fear tip is to lick your teeth. So inside and out, you want to do this outside the room before you get in. But lick your teeth and you'll get a little bit of spit to work with. Then always smile and make eye contact while you're giving your interviews. That is key. Key, key, key. If you can't do anything else, smile and make eye contact. Okay. Sitting. Now I have a question about that. So when there's so many yeah. people, let's say there's like, you know, five people, I don't know, are there. Do you make eye contact with the person who asked a question or while you're answering, do you look at each person as you're answering and start with the person who asked you the question? Like, how would you? A very good that? question. A very good question. I usually address my answer to the person directly. I start my sentence answering directly to the person who asked. And then usually at some point while I'm answering my question, I will dart my eyes to different people in the room because the eye contact is what's bringing people in to your bubble. Contact finish with the person that asked the question directly. And you'll want to face them. So if they're over here from you, you might have to pivot a little bit in your seat to look them directly in the eye. And you can always pivot back. It is not like jerk. You want to do it smooth. I would say for that. And you're sitting. Let gents usually have this problem okay, gents don't sit good. with your legs yeah, too far apart it's not a locker room not cross your legs in a skirt if you have to cross something cross your ankles in a skirt why you want to keep the top of that skirt flat you don't want to see anything on the sides or underneath that's going to and you you should keep your shoulder you want to keep your your head high and relaxed. It's like you're on a date at a nice restaurant. You want to be personable. You want to look relaxed, but you want to comport yourself with some dignity, some respect and refinement. Your speech, you should know that silence
and things like ending sentences with prepositions or any way is not a word. It's just any way. Things, grammar things that you might wish to address within your own speech before you get there. Introvert versus extrovert. Now, you might say that introversion plays poorly to a, an interview situation. It doesn't. Just look up, smile, be yourself. And I know we're kind of running a little bit short on time, so I'll try to breeze through some of this. Otherwise, we're going to have to do another feature. The <laughs> extroverts tone it down. Don't interrupt them when they're talking. Give everybody their moment in the sun. Don't bloviate. If you don't know the answer, don't say I'll look it up later because you won't. I would say that's something I need to learn more about because clearly you do. Don't be afraid of being wrong. They want someone trainable. They don't need somebody that knows everything. If you knew everything, you wouldn't have to do a residency. So there you are. Discrete knowledge, case workups, those are things that you're going to practice on externships till you die. By the time you get to the interview, you either know it or you don't. For the social questions, you want to have a couple of life experiences that you can draw from. So that if somebody asks you a question like, tell me about a time in your life when, blah, 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 you can say, oh, yes, there was this club that I was president of in college, or there was this time that I saved my baby sister from drowning. You want to have something that you can draw on. So just recall some of the things that you've been involved in, some successes that you've had in your life. If you've made a mistake, own it. If you failed a semester, acknowledge it, but be ready to move on. Answer the questions constructively, but without dwelling. It's not appropriate to cry during an interview. No matter what's going on, try to, try to keep it controlled. Okay. And a lot of interviews, most people should know, are trending to be mostly social and less academic. So that tends to be in the student's favor. If you pass your boards, they know you can be trained. You can have some discrete knowledge. You will be okay. It's more about can we work with you. I always say have a joke prepared. They may ask you. And oh. my... Make sure it's clean. I have a couple if anybody wants any. Uh, my favorite one right now is, um, did you hear about the guy who's entire, who lost his entire left side? No. He's all right now. I know. It's a groaner. Oh. <laughs> it's a complete dad joke. It's a complete dad joke, but it's clean. So and it's slightly <laughs> medical. <laughs> So have them memorized, have one or two, you know, you can draw them out, you can make them short, just whatever you need, just be prepared. Okay. Then you need to have your elevator speech prepared. That's your five minute version of tell me about yourself. So you need to have something that's a 30 second version and you need to have a five minute version so that if you said, well, I'm a podiatrist, I grew up here, I trained here, I did that and some of my interests are this, sentence done. 30 seconds. You also need to have a version that's about five minutes so that if somebody said, tell me about yourself, you can talk and you can start and end. You need to have a start and end. It's important to have a goal and not just keep talking for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the uncomfortable questions. We talked about educational missteps. If you have something going on in your personal life, if they ask you something that says, you know, why didn't you extern with us? You want to answer honestly. So say, oh, I applied, but I wasn't accepted. Or unfortunately, I had too many filled months. Or I, I didn't have a chance, but I've been corresponding with this resident. Or I didn't have a chance, but I visited and I really enjoyed my visit for this reason. You want to turn it around so that it focuses positively on you as an interviewee and a potential candidate. Okay. And if they ever ask you where you are ranking them, know that this is technically illegal for them to ask you that question, but programs do. I would answer honestly again, but with a version of your comfortable truth. So if you are ranking them number one and you want to go there, feel confident telling them that. They want to know that. If you truly believe that you are ranking them number one. However, if you are not ranking them number one, or if you're not sure yet, give them an honest answer like, well, you're in my top three, or 
you're in my top two or you're in my top five or I'm waiting till interviews are done to decide on that. Something okay. that keeps the ball in your court. That's what you want to do. If they bring up any isms that make you uncomfortable, sexism, racism, ageism, something that is slightly derogatory to you or to another group and you don't feel comfortable with that question, own it and say, that question doesn't make me comfortable or I don't feel comfortable answering that. Respond thoughtfully, but always professionally. Don't ever get heated. Just keep it calm, cool, and collected. You're a cucumber. That's it. Just a cucumber. Just cool and calm. <laughs> Okay. And straight and, 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 and straight up confident and the questions to ask them, I will run through super quick and don't panic. Everybody's going to get this document later with my list of questions. So here we go. Number of facilities covered. You can glean from this, whether or not you're going to have to do a lot of driving. And if you've never been to the city, traffic could be an issue. Number of residents per year. What are the new first years like? Did they up their numbers? Did they drop their numbers? What's the trend? Are there any new attendings? What style are the attendings? Are there, is there a lot of pimping? Do they let you hold the knife or do they say, watch me while I do this procedure? How many residents are scrubbed into this procedure? Because the reason you want to know that is that uh, only the first assist counts as a logged procedure. So if you are the second assist or the third assist, you don't get anything, just life experience. So know that. Know what the relationship is with ortho teams or vascular teams or gen surge teams. Is it easy to get cases? Is it hard to get cases? Do you get to scrub on ortho cases or are they really anti-podiatry? You want to know what the call schedule is. You want to know where people typically end up after residency. Is research required? Do they help you? Is there a grant process? Are they a primary admit service? What that means is when patients get admitted, does the podiatrist have to cover all of their medical concerns or is it a consult service where the podiatrist just handles the foot concerns? That's a very important question and they don't always tell you that. And that is pro tip is the question I always save for when they ask you at the end of interviews, do you have any questions? And you should, you should have at least one question tagged in your brain that you can ask them. Okay. You want to know how the day is structured. Do you do group rounds? Are you independent rounds? How are surgeries divided between residents? How are they scheduled? What's the clinic schedule? Are there any special focuses like wound care or pediatrics? What are the didactics like? The type, the frequency, who leads them? Is it the residents or is it the attendings? Do you have a CME stipend? Is this on top of or taken out of your salary? And that's a good question to save for the end of an interview too. Do you uh, ask the residents, don't ask this in an interview, but ask the residents, is there food provided and what's the vacation like? And save those questions till you've asked a few other questions so they know that you're serious and you're not just looking for food and vacations, like yeah. we all are. <laughs> and you want to talk about health insurance, is that provided? Then one to two weeks after, you want to see, you know, you want to express your continued interest in these programs and then don't reach out to the director if you can help it, but reach out to a resident and say, hey, I'm still interested. Loved my interview. Really hope you rank me high. You know, I'm doing well. And this is the only time in your life that you have control as the student. Up until now, it's been the program has to pick you. When you rank programs as to be a resident, it's finally in favor of the students. So you want to make sure that you make the proper call. Special concerns. If this year is all virtual, you must do the same grooming and clothes that you did if it was in person. Yes, you must wear professional pants, even if you won't be seen <laughs> below the waist. You must wear professional pants and shoes. You have to be in that mindset. You need to choose a new, neutral background. And you shouldn't have any children or pets that are going to interrupt you. You should adjust your lighting and your sound, test it out, and make sure it's all perfect before you log on. Your internet connection has to be stable, very stable, before you log on. Use your cell data. This is the time to use your cell data if you are going for a professional interview. Uh, turn off any alarms and log on early. If it is in person but there's COVID, remember to smile with your eyes 
We can see that even if you're wearing a mask. You can smile with your eyes. And I like a sterile high five myself. So what you do is you hit your own arm as you're doing a high five. And you have to hit it at the same time. And that <laughs> makes the high five sound without actually hitting the other person. Um, I do this in the OR all the time with the reps when their products work out really well for me. Then I do sterile <laughs> high five. I love, love it. it. <laughs> so closing thoughts be yourself. Programs are looking for someone smart, relatable, willing, and trainable. Mm -hmm. Trainable is the most. All right. Hi, everyone. We're going to see if we can get Dr. Lyons back on so we can finish this up. All right. As we're waiting for Dr. Lyons to come back on, if you have any other questions, go ahead and put it in the question box, and then we'll see if we can get to it at the end. All right, we're back in the game. All right. I think, yes, I think it just got the IGTV thing and it just cut it off, but we can, we'll post both parts. So yeah. Perfect. You want to continue? Sorry about that. Oh, that's perfectly fine. I talked too much. The, okay, so all I was saying is at the end, closing thoughts, just be yourself. They want to hire somebody that is trainable and that's willing to learn, somebody that's personable. Anybody can t be taught how to do anything. So the, the hand skills are, are learnable. The discrete knowledge is, is learnable. The thing that is not necessarily learnable is being a good person. So you want to make sure that that's your true focus and you want to show that in yourself. I guess if, the only other thing that I could say is if you have a situation where you do have to do two things at once, where you have to say hand tie or you have to suture and answer questions, Again, just go back to the smile, look up, make eye contact. That'll save you no matter what you're doing. Awesome. Yeah. I don't, I know people are joining back in. So if you have any questions, definitely put it in the comments and then we can talk about it. And then we will be posting up a document that, um, I know yeah, I'll sit tight and see if anyone asks any other questions. But for those of you who stuck around till the end, if you are looking to get, when it comes to podiatric medicine information, I know that. Um, you know, I learned a lot of new things today, and I'm going to take note of that. Awesome. Well, I hope everybody had a great time. And uh, if you have any more questions, if anybody has any direct questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. I, I will, they can give you my email address, um, which is just my first name. It's Josephine, J-O-S-E-P-H-I-N-E dot P dot Lyons, my last name, L-Y-O-N-S, at gmail.com, and you can ask me any questions that you want. I have students from last year, from the year before, that would text me, hey, I got, I'm looking at this outfit. What do you think? Like, do you think this is interview appropriate? Snap. And I'll say, wow. yes, yes, go for it, or mm, maybe, or well, how do you feel about it? Does it, does it make you feel great or no and, and they'll be like I don't know about it and I'm like okay well then maybe move on or <laughs> if, if people are panicking the night before feel free send me an email shoot me a text if you got my number and I'm happy to say you know okay I'll talk you off a cliff we'll be just fine what can, what can I do for you what do you need to know so no question is too small nor too big that you think that nobody's here, nobody can help me. So there's always somebody that can can help you, can be there for you, can answer content that you guys are posting and everything that is coming out of what you guys are doing. I really, really love to see the students really giving back and making it meaningful for the next generation of podiatry. So for me to you guys at PodMed Adventures, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. It's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care and happy Sunday. Thank you. Happy Sunday to you guys. Bye-bye, everybody.